All right, good afternoon. My name is Jolene. And I'm here, and I'm, I'm with the New Zealand Humanists. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce this afternoon's next speaker. Mtiaz Shams is well known among the international ex-Muslim community. He was one of the first brave few to go public about being an ex-Muslim in the hope that having visible ex-Muslims would make it easier for others who had left Islam. One of his main focuses was to let other ex-Muslims know that they are not alone. Mtiaz has helped form networks and communities of ex-Muslims around the world, even in places as far away as in New Zealand. At times, these networks have been used to rescue ex-Muslims who found themselves in dangerous situations. In 2015, MTRs co-founded Faith the Faithless, a UK organisation that provides platforms for those who have left conservative religions to speak about their experiences. Along with his work with ex-Muslims, MTRs has looked for opportunities to build bridges with Muslims Earlier this year, he was the first openly ex-Muslim speaker at an Islamic conference where he spoke about the experience of leaving Islam and how isolating it can be. Through his work, MTRs hopes to keep families together despite their differing views on religion. MTRs's perspective and approach offers hope for a future where ex-Muslims and apostates from other religions are increasingly accepted by their families and their communities. Please welcome MTR Shams. Thank you, Jolie. So, can everyone hear me at the back? Yes? Yes, great. Um, just to start off, I want to say I'm quite jealous of our Maori atheist sisters and brothers because they can start off with a mihi, is that called, what it's called? That's quite secular. If you think, uh, Imtiaz, why are you so cultural? How do you know that? Well, I asked a receptionist just in the front, <laughs> who's Maori. Um, and in Muslim communities, we have something we start off with as well. It's in sermons, in khutbahs that we do in mosques. Uh, but you'll see why it's not the same thing. So I'll try to do a bit of it. Oh, God. I'll try to do a bit of it. <coughs> okay, so it would start, you'd be in a mosque, you know, you'd be sitting there, you're all boys, because you're all boys. Uh, the girls are in the little section in the side. And it'd be something like, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru. Wait, 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 where am I? Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina, wa shururi anfusina wa min sayyiti a'malina. So, now that's the first bit, but it actually goes on quite further, and I've butchered the Arabic. But to understand why I don't secularize this, let's go through the interpretation. It starts off with, praise be to Allah. That's the beginning of the problem. Uh, we seek his help and forgiveness. I don't really, but yeah. Uh, and the second line, we seek refuge from evil of our own souls. I don't really believe in souls. And bad deeds, like speaking in a humanist conference. So what ends up happening is you, it's, it's kind of difficult to secularize. Well, I imagine the Mihis are a little bit, you can kind of make it your, what you want, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm Imtia Shams. I'm a uh, founder of Faith to Faithless. Uh, I'm also a trustee of Humanist UK. Uh, and as of this conference, I'm also a photographer, apparently. Um, now, I want to talk to you about what people go through leaving conservative religions. And we usually talk about conservative, we talk about high control. We don't talk about conservative religions only. It's about high control elements. You find that in quite liberal traditions as well. You find that in cults. Um, and initially, I wasn't going to tell my story. I was going to focus much more on the, the trends. But actually, listening to the, uh, the Modi speakers, um, I think it's quite interesting to listen to the parallels. So I'll talk a little bit about my story. So I grew up, uh, I'm British, but I grew up in Saudi Arabia 10 years there. Uh, and then I went to East London, both liberal bastions of the world. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then um, I left Islam. And I left Islam, and I was sure of one thing. I was sure that I was the only person out of 1.6 billion people who are Muslim to have ever left Islam. And not in a cool way, in like a really, really like what the hell is happening way. Um, and then quite quickly, I think I realized, okay, like obviously there's other people. And they were all online, unfortunately. So everyone was online. So they were all on a place called Reddit. Anyone know Reddit? Reddit? Yeah, okay. Surprising mix of age demographics there actually with a yes. But um, Reddit is like a big kind of, space with lots of little groups as well that make it up. And one of these groups was the 
ex-Muslim subreddit. Uh, at the time, we had 1,800 people. I was one of them, I was solid 0.18% of the group. Um, we now have 36,000 people, just shows you how quickly things, are. that was five years ago. So what I started doing is realizing, wait, there's all these online people, but I'm like a human person. Like we're all human people, we like to meet each other and all that. So I said, let me try to meet people. Uh, but imagine you thought only three months ago you're alone and there's this whole like people trying to like kill you thing. So you, you, you're a bit like, what do I do? How do I do this? Because I'm in the closet at the time. So I remember my first time trying to meet an ex-Muslim from online. It was in um, King's Cross, in, you know anyone King's Cross in, in London? It's a big station, um, Harry Potter, well known for, during one of his psychedelic trips, he <laughs> tried to get into a, a magical city through the pillar. Um, so King's Cross, I met him at St. King's Cross and it was at a, at a coffee shop, coffee shop, coffee, coffee shop, um, in a coffee shop, uh, I think Starbucks. And I remember I got one of my non-Muslim friends from uni. I said to her, I said, can you sit there and text me a picture of the guy so I know he's, you know, he's all right. And so she did that to me and obviously it was completely stupid, but at the time I was terrified, right? So I met the guy and, you know, uh, he was this ex-Muslim guy. Never, he was my first person to meet as well as he was, he, he was mine. And, um, and yeah, so since then, you know, I set up groups. Um, the first group was in London. Uh, uh, but yeah, New Zealand was, New Zealand's ex-Muslim group is a very interesting one actually because I'd set up other groups around the world. There's one in Australia I set up, but the Americans I set up with them rather than I set that up. New Zealand was the first that I had no idea it existed. And then they kind of got in touch with me and I was like, oh my God, you're doing similar things with what we're doing around the world. So it was very cool. Now, what happened was I started realizing that the problems ex-Muslims had were so standardized across all leaving religion stories. Uh, so, and it, Faith to Faithless really started about actually about four years ago, in fact, because I was in my kitchen with an ex-Hasidic Jewish friend, ultra-Orthodox Jewish friend, and we were laughing because our parents were the same. And uh, that's when I was like, wow, this is much bigger than the ex-Muslim issue. So often, and this comes back to this idea of apostasy and danger. Often when people think about apostasy, they look at death threats as the, the real problem. And yes, that's a massive issue. I mean, as you've heard before, that the, the you know, death is a problem. I, ha I have had a few death threats myself. Uh, but to be honest, if you're in Pakistan, the range of death threats you're gonna get is very different from if you're in London. Um, but actually, the way I try to explain apostasy discrimination, if you even wanna think about it, is to compare it to LGBT discrimination. When we talk about gay people being discriminated, we don't talk about them being burnt off buildings. That's a problem. But really, we talk about the whole range of things. We talk about people being discriminated at work. We talk about people being looked at funny at school, being bullied. It's the whole gamut of things. And with apostasy, we don't do that yet. And I, th I want it, that conversation to move so it can include people like the Modis who are, who are you know, being an atheist in your own community can, yeah, maybe no one's gonna stab you, or I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what the death threat situation <laughs> is with the Maori culture, but, <laughs> but you, want that, you want them to be included in that because that's discriminatory. So like a little bit of the kind of problems that people face, you know, if you talk to, even if you speak to, I deal with a lot of ex-Muslims from Saudi Arabia because it produces a lot of ex-Muslims. And believe it or not, theocracies, who knew? Um, and even they speak about shunning, they speak about family, they even speak about, I don't want to hurt my mother. I remember this one boy I was dealing with in Iraq, he's, um, he's from a Shia background, and the Shia, like people think, oh, they're cool, no, 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 they're just as bad when it comes to high control, they can be just as bad. And he was running away from the, he was in, in threat because the Shia militia were gonna kill him. Uh, for being an atheist. They saw him in some of the some protests and he couldn't leave Iraq because he was like, I love my mother, I can't leave her here. So imagine in that situation, the problems are still family related. And this is the problem with apostasy. People forget the family issue is the biggest issue in many cases. So it all sounds a little bit negative maybe, um, but I wanna put a positive spin to it. Uh, I'm an irrationally optimistic person and I think what we found with apostates what we found with apostates was we knew we were scum. Like, we, no one cares about apostates. No media organization picks us up or any of that. So apostates started to build their own groups. They for, forget about the wider world. We'll do our own thing. Jehovah's Witnesses organized. Ex-Hasidic Jewish people organized. We organized. And we started fighting for our own rights in this way, right? Um, and slowly, people are listening. So just last week, there was a film called Apostasy. Anyone hear about it? Yeah, Apostasy. Ex-Jehovah's Witness, uh, 
director, it is probably going to win for Sundance. It's doing very well. And it's, so it's a film that's good in its own right. It's about leaving the Jehovah's Witness Church, right? And <clears throat> two months ago, Netflix, anyone know Netflix? Yes, you do. Uh, released a documentary called One of Us. One of, any, anyone seen that documentary, One of Us? Yeah? It's about people leaving the Hasidic Jewish community, ultra-Orthodox community. And if something's on Netflix and it does well, you know that this is an area they're going to continue pumping out things about because they've got all these algorithms and stuff. So... The fact is that things are going well, and Faith to Failures, we've been featured in documentaries, we've been in four documentaries up till now. Uh, I was on a Vice documentary, we've done a few BBC things. Uh, just coming here, we had uh, a couple of interviews with New Zealand radio stations. Um, so we're part of that as well, right? So what, what is Faith to Failures? We're a program of Humanist UK. I always, well, not always, because I didn't even know what a humanist was. Uh, I, when I figured out what a humanist is and figured out what Humanist UK is doing, realized, wait, there's a natural collaboration, uh, and we both realized, actually, Humanist UK did as well, between the humanists and people who suffer for leaving high-control religious groups. In, and historically, humanism actually was often full of those people leaving Christian churches. But today, you know, it's, uh, you get second-generation, third-generation humanists, but there's a natural collaboration there. And so what does Fate to Fate is actually do? Like, I think the first thing is, Going back to my story, I was the only person. This is a common story. You speak to all the ex-Muslims on that table, they'll say the same. You speak to ex-Christians, a lot of them from high control groups will say the same. If you're from, is it Gloria Vale? Is that a yeah. cult thing, apparently, in the South? Um, yeah, so they will say probably the same. They'll say, I didn't know you could leave it. So the first thing we do is outreach. Um, we do panels normally. Let's say there's three people. They've never spoken. They're often shaking and they'll tell their stories and because it's so raw because it's so real it's a really like emotional story and we film them we put up on youtube and they do quite well the second thing we do is um and and, and i'll talk a little bit about why that's important because often people don't leave and they suffer because they don't know you can leave so i remember once one of the videos i think it was a personal video for ex-muslims i did and there was a a kid who commented on it saying something a bit angry, you know, like you get lots of crazy YouTube comments. And I think I messaged something, but I got bored or I got distracted and I didn't. And then two months later, I felt kind of bad. So I kind of messaged back going, taking his points much more like nicely. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. I didn't even know you could leave. I've left Islam two months later. So he was like, yeah, don't, you don't need to debate me. I'm an ex-Muslim already. <laughs> so, uh, so this happens time and time again. And one of the coolest things about the videos we do is because we put them on YouTube and the way the algorithms work, you'll be like a little Jehovah's Witness kid, you'll be like going through Jehovah's Witness videos, and then you'll be like, wait, what is this ex-Jehovah's Witness? And YouTube thinks you wanna watch that, so you, of course you watch it, because you're like, what is this? And often we find comments from people going, I, didn't, I don't even know how I'm here, because that's what happens with YouTube, you go down a weird rabbit hole, and they're like, I didn't even know it's a thing. So it's a really interesting phenomenon that we're seen by wider society because of the fact that we do these videos. Uh, the second thing we do, which is kind of quite serious stuff, is we did a bit of research with apostates. Like, what do you want? What do you actually want? Because we thought you want therapy. We thought you want these things like that. But they said, no, we do want that. But actually what we want is for existing services to treat us better. And I'll give you an example of that real case six months ago. Um, a young ex-Muslim girl contacted me she was 14. Anyone under the age of 18, we pushed straight into a child-related charity. She was wearing the hijab, not in a good place, very patriarchal family. And we pushed them to a well-known charity that I won't mention on, you know, on TV, uh, who deals with children's issues. They've got a hotline. So I gave them, her the number. She, she, I didn't hear back from her for two weeks. She contacted me back again going, um, Imtiaz, I've contacted them, and the lady on the side listened to her and said, it sounds like your issues are to do with leaving Islam, maybe you should go back. 14-year-old girl. And she was saying that since then, the reason she contacted me again was not because to complain, because this was two weeks later, is because her father, she had said to her father, I want to be something like, go to university and do this thing, and her father said, you can never do that, you're gonna be a wife. So she's so depressed, and she's put on weight, she's been, become very depressed, and you know, this is because they don't know how to deal with these people. And so we set up a training program for 
uh, service providers. We raised 10,000 pounds from humanists, British pounds, not, none of this New Zealand dollar stuff. I, <laughs> why does everyone have a dollar that doesn't correspond with each other? But we raised 10,000 pounds and we use it to train institutions. So just uh, last month, I think, we trained the Met Police, uh, uh, you know, which is a big, big police force. And what was great is the chief constable um, without us bribing him, because he can't be bribed, um, said it was the best training course he's received in his 27 years in the Met. And I think that was a really nice, uh, nice thing to be told. So, I speak up and down the UK talking about humanism, uh, talking to humanists about apostasy. I also come as far as New Zealand, 26 hour flight. And I often get asked like, what can we do, right? What can we do to help? So I think there's two things. The first is, to just keep supporting apostates. It's a big human rights challenge of today. Like, it is untouched. But we're, we're at that tipping point where things are really starting to change. The fact that documentaries are being made, the fact that the Jehovah's Witness Church is being looked at about their sexual abuse scandals in Australia, and I think even here, shows you that people are becoming a little bit less politically correct with these things. Um, and if you are a humanist, it's quite likely you've had a professional background or you are connected to professional people. Come to us, take our resources, and see if you can expand that knowledge of apostasy to your local institutions. I, we focus on the UK right now with training, but I'm sure that with Andrew's blessing, we can kind of shift it to other humanist groups uh, at some point in the near future. Um, the second thing I think is quite close to my heart, which is about making humanist groups apostate friendly. And of course you guys are open, like of course you're open, but when I talk about apostate friendly, you have to remember where people come from. I remember I had an event with ex -Jehovah's Witness, an ex-Jehovah's Witness panel that I happened to be chairing, and someone in the audience, who later became one of our speakers, Theo, he said, I've just left the Jehovah's Witness church 12 days ago. I'm standing, he's gay as well, he, I'm standing here, and I can't trust anyone in this audience. He was like, because I wasn't raised with any of you. So he's like, I can't, I look at you and I don't feel a human connection. So really, these are traumatized people. How do you make a safe place for them in humanist groups so that they can be part of that? because you'll get something out of it. You know, we live, we live in a reasonably give and take society. When you've got a Jehovah's Witness who from the age of 12 has been knocking on doors and talking to people and sharing ideas, you've got a very good volunteer on your hand, right? <laughs> a very good volunteer. So, so, you know, if humanism needs good volunteers, then I think there's a nice, there's a nice stitch up there. Um, and I think the final thing with, with this apostate friendly thing is like, you know, apostates are so traumatized. Us being in groups of other traumatized people is not always good for us, right? Like, trust me on this, I've seen this firsthand. So one thing we've tried to do is make it cross apostasy. So we have Jehovah's Witness and ex-Muslims, ex-JWs and ex-Muslims, they're a bit nicer to each other. Um, but also being part of humanist groups, then you're kind of a little bit more filtered out. And you, your trauma is directed kind of a bit more positively, I think. Uh, so it's a very important thing for us to have humanists actually understand how to bring us in. And if you need advice on how to do that, find your local apostate or contact me. I'll be more than happy to try to help you with that. I think the final thing is, um, just to talk about New Zealand a little bit, I think you actually are ahead of the game. So I've been dealing with a few asylum cases in Australia, but there was one in New Zealand I know of, and there's a few others that I know you guys have helped. And actually, I've seen apostates talk about your humanist groups quite positively. So already you're doing something that not everyone is doing. In Britain, it's been like, it's 50-50, some groups are really good at that and some groups are not, and we need to uh, make that homogenous. But you guys are pretty good, so if you have any questions, uh, I'll take them now, and of course I'm here till like sort of next Wednesday and I don't have a life, so you're more than welcome to ask me. Thank you. <laughs> questions. Hands for questions. Uh, in America, we have a strong. Yes, sorry. In America, we have a strong tradition of pluralism, and uh, it seems that uh, Islam has this commitment to the book, which is the Quran, which is, as I understand it, understood to be been written by God Himself, and and so to the extent that the Quran has uh, has bad things to say about apostates. Uh, how do how do how do uh, uh, Muslims come to terms with those things in it and not and and not treat uh, people who are apostates uh, in a disparaging or even hateful or or killing way? I mean, it it seems that that there is a contradiction there that's different than Christianity, which doesn't 
have the same um, fundamentalist, I mean, doesn't have the yeah, same right. commitment to the Bible as, as Islamists have to the Koran. So just, just one thing is interesting is the evangelical Christians, especially from the South, the ex-Christians that I've met, some of their experience really mimic some of the ex-Muslim experiences because not every ex-Muslim is at risk of death, right? So if we take that to the side, which is still a lot of people, that's often actually there is a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of similarities, but there is a problem with literalism in Islam. And um, I think there's a few solutions to that. One is I'm an atheist, so I believe that this is all made up, which means that humans can just make it up however they want, even if it's literal. Um, the second is, Ra irrationally being optimistic, I think people often put their humanity in front of their book if it, their, their, their loved ones are on the line. And I'll tell you a real story, which I'll kind of change a little bit because of who it's talking about. Um, someone I know, very involved in my life, um, I, I, they were one of the first people I came out to as an ex-Muslim, and they were like, they're a really nice person, but they were like, but do you know in an Islamic state you should be killed? I was like, do you believe that? And they went off for two weeks and came back and they were like, no, 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 you don't need to be. I was like, thanks, that's great. <laughs> so, uh, so, so people change. And I think what's nice is even the crazy, quite radical people have been countered by this apostate thing for so long because it's contradictory to their thing about you, it's a religion where you can choose to be Muslim. So they've actually come back and they're starting to change in the West. The problem is Islamic countries are not going to change for a long time with this area. And there's no positivity from there. I can't be positive about it because it'd be lying. In the West, what we can do is we can make sure that we create a safe bubble for ex-Muslims and especially because that will hopefully be transported. But the East is a very different game. Like the Muslim countries are a very different game to the West. So. The problem with, yeah, the problem with that is that even if someone is committed to the Quran, that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to have really crazy views. So, like, I've got members of my family where they're quite religious and literally religious, but there's no danger f from them to me. Uh, they're in t the problem is it's very hard for an outsider to understand the nuances of how people interact with faith. I mean, it's hard for sociologists to do that, right? So it's a very tricky question, and... I think it's something that I'm going to leave the security services to deal with, and they're getting quite good at that, to be, to be fair to them. Yeah? So. Questions? Uh, yes, gentlemen, then Trisha. Uh, I'm Randy from America, and uh, we have uh, in my group uh, several ex-Mormons who oh, are going through yeah. trauma and ostracism. Yeah. And have you had experience with them? Yes, more, uh, actually, the ex-Mormons are a community I work with very closely. Because I'm based in the UK, not as much, but online, in the online space I do, um, their issues are actually very similar to the issues of ex-Muslims uh, in particular, uh, but also ex, some ex-Orthodox Jews. They're very high control. It's a state essentially they own, so it becomes very difficult. Um, I'm planning on doing more stuff with the Mormons. I, I usually pick years to focus on an entire, so I did, this was Jehovah's Witness year. Last year was, no, this is Hasidic Jewish year. Last year was Jehovah's Witness year, the year before the ex-Muslim year. I wanna do like next year, maybe the year after ex-Mormon year. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Trisha, yes. Hi, Trisha Rogers from London. Um, you talk about this safe bubble and the safety and some of these people are at risk, but then you show videos of them on YouTube. Does that not put them on more risk? And, and how do you yeah. um, guarantee their safety? And how do you check other people that join in online are not actually yeah. searching out and are not genuine and, and yeah. putting them in danger again? Yeah. Very good question. And I can't guarantee their safety. That's a really important point. I have to think very, I mean, I was gonna do an event here in New Zealand. I'm gonna do one in Australia instead but I've had to reject one person already because I don't think they're ready. And the other person, I can't guarantee their safety, but the thing is, it's a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg because if you're not out there, you're risking the people who do put their head above the parapet more. So like me personally, the reason I came out first on my own because I don't want to involve other people, but then I realized I put my head up and I was like, actually, it's bad, but I'm not dead. 
So then we all, the other of us, we all did it. The other thing we do also is we have cross apostasy. So we don't just have ex-Muslims all in one go. We'll have an ex-Muslim, an ex-Mormon, an ex-this, an ex-that. And that kind of shifts the language from you're attacking my religion to, to you're attacking someone who's crazy, not me, you know? <laughs> Which I like, I like that very much. So, so that's one thing. Um, in terms of infiltration, uh, the groups I've set up, we have a very strict, it's like Fight Club, it's a very strict vetting process. So you have to know two, you have to meet two people independently who will vet you for this. Uh, we've never really had problems with infiltration. I want, we once let in a neo-Nazi into the Australia group, but we don't talk about it. But uh, uh, we kicked him out quite quickly. He was, he was an ex-Muslim, but he went a bit, you know. So yeah, so. Uh, there was another couple of questions. I, I'm, I know I'm probably running out of time, so. Uh, question, yes, gentlemen and the lady front. Thank you, Imtiaz. You said my name right, so you must be from the I Pakistan. Am, I'm Indian. In Indian, yeah. Yep. Okay. Same place. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. uh, I was just uh, want to refer something to you for your comment. Um, it is said in expert circles, and I'm thinking of a Melbourne conference, uh, that the, if you put a human face to Salafist Islam, and people from Salafist and Wahhabi who join up to be jihadist, uh, or even young Australians and possibly young Kiwis too, uh, they, the question was asked, why do they enlist? And the answer from the expert was, because if you put the human face to these young people, both male and female, they have been disenfranchised. Uh, they're angry, society doesn't accept them, and especially now if you're Muslim, people give you a long look. So then, the, uh, the question was put to the expert who was from the IRA. Yeah, not from the IRA, but he gave advice to the IR, IRA problem. How, how should we proceed? And he put, put it to the panel that you don't do what has been done where some politicians said, you either are with us or against us. He said, don't isolate them. He said, reach out to them to the point before they become radicalized. And he had an arrow, and there was a point in the arrow where he said, once they go past this point, they're angry, they don't care, they'll, they'll, they'll become jihadists. So I was wondering about your opinion on the advice that reach out to a Muslim uh, and make friends and so that they don't feel isolated. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a slight risk with that, which is that don't kill me, so I'm going to be nice to you. Let's be friends. That doesn't really work. That's not an honest human interaction with someone, right? And I think there's a real um, problem with that kind of approach. I'm not saying he was wrong because I wasn't there, but I think you have to be very careful what reaching out means. Um, I think a lot of, I, I grew up, I went to a school where my nickname was terrorist at school. I, have, I still have a t-shirt with bombs drawn on it because that was my nickname, right? It was terrorist, as you do, banter, lad banter. But, um, uh, and that just made me more religious, not less, to be honest. But. Uh, if you had come to me at that time going, hey, so uh, do you want to be friends? Uh, and you know, it would just feel, feel weird. The, the, anger, the anger and the isolation, it's, a lot of it is to do with being completely isolated from the world and ideas. It's actually very much about being isolated from other human beings who are different and ideas. And some of that is to do with ghettoization. Some of it is to do with schooling. Some of it is to do with how kind of people think the Muslims are this box, the Jehovah's Witnesses are this box, and da, 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 and let's leave them to do their thing. And when they have crazy views about women or this and that, that's their thing. It's kind of racist, actually, in that sense. And people often talk a little bit about the liberal left and how they've let down. I do think they've let down these communities because they've boxed them up. They've essentialized them that your skin color and your ethnicity and your background is why you are Muslim. And that's all you are. And if you're from outside that, like I am, you must be an outsider. You're coconut or whatever it is, right? Or they use racist terms like native informant. So it's a, I have to be honest, like I'm not an expert in counter extremism. Uh, I'm, I'm reasonably knowledgeable. I have lots of friends in that space, but I try not to get into what are the solutions. Um, what I do know is that you have to be very careful how you think about it. Uh, really, really quickly, uh, I know there's a few of the questions. Uh, one example of that is they, the madrasas, the Islamic schools in, in the UK are much better now. Back in my day, they used to slap us around, smash against walls and blah, blah, blah. Now they don't really do that, which is nice. Um, <laughs> but that's because of the terrorism stuff, right? So people went, we don't like that. There's producing crazy people. We should be nice to the, uh, We should be protecting the rights of the child. They don't do that with Hasidic Jewish communities. They don't care what goes on in their bet like they don't, uh, in, their, in their schools. They don't care, 
right? And that means those kids end up suffering, but because they're not blowing anyone up or they're not causing problems, no one cares. Mm. And like my, my thing is, this is a problem across. It's not to do with one community. Not, the Islamic communities seem to create some certain types of problems, but then so do other communities. And we need to be particularly careful that we apply kind of humanist values and secular values and things across the spectrum. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, got question. Any more questions? More, oh, really? Oh, I speak so fast. That's great. Who? Who? Yeah. Question. Yes. Um, I just had a question about um, the decision whether or not to to come out as an apostate. Like, what your views are yeah. in yeah. making that decision. Yeah. Um, I used to be of the opinion that I never ever recommend anyone to come out because it's such a traumatizing experience. It's such a. I can't even like, you know. Uh, the nicest experiences are still kind of shitty, right? Um, but having now spent five years working with not just ex-Muslims, but a lot of other ex-religious people, I think it's actually quite healing in many ways because there's something called emotional distance. So like I remember when I was in the closet as an ex-Muslim, I naturally just left my family. I, didn't, I couldn't be in that space and constantly reminded about my religious bringing in whatever and that's not good because my family do love me you know there's a real bond between me and my family and that emotional distance didn't help and then all, all and then obviously when i came out any ex-muslim comes out it's always a big kerfuffle and you can be homeless and blah 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 but eventually things generally get better right and i know there's people in this audience that i can immediately think of who took that risk and it's worked out for the better because what's hap what happens is your family has to make a decision about you and most families, especially in communities where they're very tight knit, they do end up accepting you. It just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot. It takes you understanding how to create boundaries. It takes them understanding how to grow the hell up, and they do grow up. A lot of them grow up. So, I've shifted actually to now. I the end goal is coming out. How you do that is up to you. Whether you're on a panel like me or whether you're in your little community, it's up to you. But we need to do that both for you and politically, because we need more people out there, and people are doing it. And now what's amazing is people I knew who joined the groups saying, you know, very timid, I'm never gonna come out, I can't do it, not even in my, they come out and they see how their life gets better. I know a girl in Germany right now, she's from a very religious Afghan family in, in London, and she came out after two years of talking to ex-Muslims, and she was so timid, like you wouldn't even imagine, you wouldn't have ever imagined she would. She didn't just do that, she left to Germany. She went, I'm, I'm gonna escape, I'm gonna go to Germany. She now has started to build a new relationship with her family. So it works, it generally works. Yeah. Question from the lady there, gentlemen. You, you talk about um, leaving family, but what about when, the, when you're leaving um, a religion that is the state the opposite, yeah. and the implications of what will happen to you when the state controls and decides if you live or die because of your religion? Yeah. This family left um, be, because he was no longer, um, uh, no longer believed yeah. and came to New Zealand. Uh, they can't associate with their family overseas um, because they will either die if they go back, or he will. She will be in a um, burqa for the rest of her yeah. days, um, and she will be in her brother's house. So the choices for them appear from us yeah. to be limited. So that seems to be a little bit different to the story here yeah. versus a Saudi Arabian experience, Absolutely which is right. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, I know of, uh, three people, one of them is my friend in, in, in the US, who either got asylum or they just live there now, and they have the same situation. Their families do want to interact with them, but they can't. Uh, what's good is that I know in one of the cases, the family is going to the US. The, she doesn't go back to Saudi. The family goes to the US to see her, but it does mean that permanently they were not gonna have a bond. It's gonna be a very weak bond. And yeah, that's it. That's, the, that's it. Like, I can't go further than that. I can't say that's gonna be fine. It probably won't. It'll be like that their whole life. They'll have to raise up kids if that's what they do and live here and and maybe the family will decide to come, maybe we won't. It makes also harder for them to have that relationship with family, even if they want it. Yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's particularly traumatizing, and um, what's, while I can't say that's gonna get better, what can we do here, right? Like, we know what that means. We know they're gonna be alone. We know that they're not gonna have family. 
I've got people that I consider my family that's not from Bangladesh, right? Like they're, they're my kind of non, you know, my ex-Muslim family or, or my non-religious family or just some guy I met at a comedy club. But like, you know, they're my friends. And, and so you kind of build a new family as well. So I can't, you know, I can't consciously say, is that the word? No, that's not the word, but anyways. I can't say that's gonna get better with Saudi, but what can they do here? Yeah. There was another question. Yes. Oh, there's lots of, yeah, question, yes. Thank you, Mtaz. Um, your fellow defector, uh, my name's Chris, I'm local rationalists and humanists. Uh, your fellow defector, um, Ayan Hirshi Ali, mm -hmm. uh, was advocating for a Muslim reformation. It strikes me that your organization could be a feeder into that process. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Uh, we don't do that because we don't deal with reform of any religion. We don't care about it. Our focus is apostates. So there's other people doing great work in other spaces. We're very, very narrow in our focus on apostates. Um, personally, there's, so there's a personal element here. Um, I was actually on a panel with ex-Muslims of North America about reform. Um, I tend to be seen sometimes as the soft ex-Muslim, but actually on reform, I'm a bit, as an atheist, I think you can do anything because it's all man-made, so it can kind of go anywhere at once. And Islam does have a history where it's been very, like the Mutazili, for example, the rationalists, they were early on. But like, you know, like that can come back. Like there's lots of things that can happen. The problem is more political in how Muslims interact with Islam. Uh, if it's literalist, you're just not gonna get that. The rationalists used to say, if, the, if logic is right and the Quran is wrong, I will choose logic, the Mutazili. So are Muslims gonna head to that direction? Maybe, maybe not, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, uh, we, as an organization, we, we are very focused on apostasy. We don't go much beyond that on purpose. There's other people that do that great work, so. Uh, there's another question. The, yeah, qu yeah. Oh. yeah, okay, yes. I have been taking this side quite a lot. Hey. Yes. Um, I, I really just wanna add something to what you said is that about people taking risks and, and what happens, and I'm, I'm ex-Mormon, and um, for me, uh, the risk was quite low. You know, my family were supportive. Um, I didn't have a lot invested that I was gonna lose as a result. I lost friends, but um, yeah. But, you know, I know people who have lost their marriage because maybe they live in Utah and they've lost custody of their children. Yep, yep, yep. Um, you know, can't see their grandkids, yep. like all kinds of stuff. But I almost never talk to someone who truly regrets Yep. leaving yep. because that huge risk that that thing you know going on YouTube when you know it's a risk sometimes it's so important to do it yep. that that risk is worth it yep. and it it's how you gain your own authenticity Absolutely, and yeah. so like as much as I know you can't protect everyone who's you know leaving or that kind of thing I think sometimes people need the truth so badly they need to be true yes. that you, you can't always yes. run away from those risks. Absolutely. You just can't. And yeah. one thing that you'll know, uh, just as much as I will, is uh, when you deal with lots and lots of people who are going through this process, you get to see patterns. And one of the patterns I see is when you're not authentic, it comes out in weird mental health ways. You get weird like reactions to it, right? And outsiders can often tell. Like, so someone might be a prolific liar. So, you know, well, you lived where you're primary caregiver, you had to lie to them since the age of two up till the age of 25 or 50, of course you're gonna be a prolific liar, right? And these kind of, you get lots and lots of these kind of issues and what's really interesting to see is how people's mental health can change quite rapidly once they've become authentic, um, right? So, so yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a, it's a very, very important point about authenticity. Uh, how many questions do I have left time for, Sarah? Uh, we'll more. Okay, cool. Yes, there was two questions at the back. I'll, I'll be really quick in my answers now, so. Um, hi, I'm Thies. I'm from Belgium, um, and I have what I believe is a, a closeted ex-Muslim as a friend, yeah. and he has been uh, counseling other people on, of on more or less the same situation uh, for an alternative way to uh, with, to kind of change his uh, re their religious views 
um, to uh, as, uh, to assume that Allah is some kind of life force, uh, kind of making the, the the very concept of Allah as a concept similar to humanity and so forth. So really making a space for themselves within religion rather than 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 really yeah, doing yeah, a hard yeah. heartbreak apostasy. Do you think it's a viable alternative, well, or do you think it <laughs> will lead to problems ultimately? Viability is an interesting thing because it's if it's happening, of course it is, right? I've got friends like the Inclusive Mosque Initiative in the UK. They've got a very open space for it. They've got like a female imam, a couple of female imams, LGBTQ imams. Like if it's happening, it's viable, right? So, um, and the fact that they include me, like I go, I've gone to their their uh, khutbas, their sermons, and I don't pray, but I'll sit and I listen, and it's usually quite hippie. It's quite nice, but like. It's it, it, the fact that it's happening means one, there's a demand, one, there's a sub, two, there's a supply. And I think the demand's actually greater than the supply. Is it going to be a reform mechanism? Probably not. Maybe not. But it might be. Like, we don't know. Uh, young, young, young Muslims really are becoming a lot more liberal. They're becoming much more understanding of LGBT rights. They're becoming much more understanding of women's rights. Uh, I, there was a, uh, there's a story I really want to tell, but I can't tell it in front of camera because it's quite personal. But if you guys ask me, talk to me later, I'll tell you a few stories. There's real change happening. And I think we, uh, so it's viable. If there's change happening, it's viable, right? Leo, question? Where's the next one? Ah, Leo, sorry, yeah. I assume everyone knows Leo, so I just kind of. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, my question is this. All our posters from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nigeria, and other Muslim countries, they can't afford to come and live in Australia and, all, and uh, the United States. I mean, I, I guess that IHU and other humanist groups are gradually getting overwhelmed with such requests. Do you have a strategy to get, in quote, our posters to be safe and to live in their home countries? Yep. Thank you. Um, so we don't have an organizational strategy. I can tell you what I do. So I've had to deal with lots of people in these Muslim countries, for example, and actually some people in Nigeria as well recently. But the first thing I do is you don't want to give them false hope. They often look at the West as their kind of source of hope. And I think that's a real, real lie people tell. I hear a lot of ex-Muslims do it, actually, and I don't like it, because it's like, no, of course they're not going to come here. One out of X number of people who are from Syria, even who are not ex-Muslims, can't get here. How do you think you're going to get here, right? So I don't want to tell that lie. I say that that's a possibility. It is. But so sometimes people have actually done well going to another Muslim country. They're, they're not known in that country. I, I've known people going to Malaysia, and they've been able to live, right? So I give them options like that. Um, there are charities, like in Pakistan, there's the Eidi Foundation, which is, I think a lot of Pakistanis know that old dude who's really famous, won a Nobel Prize, did he, I think? But a uh, really nice guy. But his, his charity is one of the few occasionally safe places some people can go to, right, in Pakistan. In Bangladesh, similarly, there's nothing, but I, I have friends there who I can pass people on to. But it's not really a solution organizationally. It doesn't work. Um, my view is the first thing we can do is tidy up the, the, other con the Western countries. If we can make the West produce an output of apostate right language and YouTube videos. What it does, it, I do see this, is people from those countries will see this as a rallying cry. They'll see this as, oh my God, I'm not crazy, I'm not alone, because they feel so trapped, it massively damages their mental health. They sit there festering, they get angry. Sometimes they get so angry, they come out publicly and they get, you know, they go missing. That's a response to how isolated they feel. So if you give them an outlet, they are smarter, I think. They integrate much more with Western uh, or safe apostates. Um, but I, organizationally, we don't. And, and I want Fade to Failures to get to the point where when, once we've sorted out our you know, stuff in these lower hanging fruit countries, what can we do in these other countries? That requires resources. It requires people on the ground. But I think we're you know, on the route there, actually, because we're already doing stuff that is directly and indirectly helping people in other countries stay safe in their countries. Yeah, so there was a couple of questions on this side and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Any other questions? Yes, gentlemen here. It's like being an auction. Any other questions? Uh, I was wondering about materials. Um, so this isn't about apostasy necessarily, but um, the path to apostasy. Um, obviously, if you're living in a country where you don't have access to um, 
you know, you're not an English speaker, you don't have access to uh, the same large volume of um, materials, maybe don't even have in uh, you know, internet access. Um, do you think it would be valuable to, uh, you know, make sort of like the Western um, uh, philosophies and science available? How, how do we how do we educate and, and, and expose um, Muslims in in the Middle East to to our ideas? Um, I think one thing is that they there is a lot of stuff already. Uh, it's just repressed. So there's a guy called Abdullah Al-Qasemi. He's a Saudi scholar who was a Salafist in Al-Azhar, one of the, the most prestigious Islamic university in the world. He became an atheist and he wrote books till he was 80. They tried to kill him twice, but they couldn't. Cancer got him in the end. Um, so his books got banned from a lot of the Middle East, but they still exist. So the, there's a lot of, we need to look at what, what is a, first look at what's coming out of those countries, right? And like try to promote that. I think that's one start. Other things you can do is absolutely, you can do translations. So for example, we have a guy who's, who speaks uh, uh, Farsi, who, tr who translates it for Iranians and, and things like that, our ex-Muslim videos. Uh, but yeah, we need more of that. We've got some guides that we're finalizing right now. By the way, you're slightly wrong. The internet is a problem for ultra-Orthodox Jews. Often they don't have internet access or if they're Jehovah's Witnesses tightly controlled in London, in the UK, sorry. So the problems of apostasy, all, those problems also apply to Western countries, right? So, so uh, we, I knew a guy who would print out really, really badly made leaflets for the local, ex, uh, the local Hasidic Jewish communities to give them a phone number, a mobile number, not a hotline, to say, if, you've, if you're thinking about doubting, this is the number. And he would just shower all of that area with it because they don't have access to internet all the time. So, but yeah, but absolutely, there are, there are mechanisms of doing it. One of the best things I, I like is how do you empower people who are from those backgrounds, who are ex-Muslims or ex-whatever, to do it themselves, because they know better how to get to their people than we do. And they're the ones who do it. So they translate, you know, Richard, Richard Dawkins' book or Carl Sagan's book or this and that. They do that themselves. Uh, we kind of don't need to be involved. What we need to do is put that all in one place so that when people come across our website, they see, oh, there's a list. I'm from, from Egypt, I can read all this Arabic stuff, right? So, yeah. uh, last question, I'm just gonna keep going until someone tells me to stop. <laughs> yes, yes. Last question, okay, last question. Yeah, Actually, thank you so much, it's uh, very inspiring to hear you and we already talked uh, later on when we heard the story about the Maoris uh, and this, the stories about ex-Muslims. I've written this year a book about 12 Dutch ex-Muslims and one of the things that they were saying in that book that's that they said, well, one of the problems we faced when we became, uh, when we experienced that we were not Muslim anymore, that we didn't want that anymore, was that they said, well, to be an atheist, to be a humanist, is considered by uh, already humanist as something Western. So to become uh, an atheist or a humanist, and that we are, uh, for example, the question that was just asked, how are we going convincing them of our ideas? Uh, they have problems with that because, because um, and they were helped actually by humanist, racialist, a atheist, homegrown from the countries where they're coming from, from Morocco, Turkey, and the Netherlands, um, uh, because they saw that they didn't, uh, uh, um, were trading to traders towards their background by becoming an atheist, because that's an extra thing yeah. for somebody who's coming from another country as an immigrant, yeah. that it's so, you know, like the Maoris, that you, uh, you, what are you going to lose when you're extra lose when you're leaving your, uh, your religion? So uh, how do you tackle that? How do you show as a faith to faceless to somebody from Pakistan, Morocco, yeah. or whatever, that being an atheist is also yeah. um, committed, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can also be committed to yeah. your background. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a very, very good point. And the first way we do that is we put people out there and like, you know, when, when I'm speaking, people can tell I'm Asian. They can tell the way I talk is very Asian. The, you know, the, the things I talk about are Asian. I'm from an Asian background. And like you put other people on stage, you know, they'll, I remember this one of our speakers, Solma, she's an ex-Muslim with two kids. And in her speeches, she like sprinkles in her own language. She just does that anyways, right? Like, and, but it's a really powerful thing for people to not go the coconut route, to not say you're this, you're that. Um, the other thing I think that's quite useful is ex, for apostates often do this, and you were mentioning this upstairs as well, which is that apostates will 
we'll own the things that we came from. So for example, for me, I use a lot of Islamic humor. I find it quite funny, to be honest. So like I'll, you know, especially with my Muslim friends, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll say like, SubhanAllah, or like Muslims, you know, like amazing, mashallah. And, um, but we also celebrate. So for example, we have in the Muslim groups, we'll celebrate Eid, right? Except we won't fast. So we just enjoy food the whole month and we'll enjoy food. <laughs> you know, it's great. And then, um, and we have, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we celebrate Christmas, but we call it Kufermas. <laughs> Um, we do Halloween, but it's called Mullaween, and it's like the theme is always Islamic horror. I mean, it's always the same thing, but uh, you know, so people, what that ends up happening is people wear, wear like saris with zombie makeup, right? Um, the Jehovah's Witness do something similar, so um, when the apostasy movie came out, someone brought a, a blue smurf. Does anyone know the, the relevance of smurfs to Jehovah's Witnesses? Anyone? No. So there's a really funny story. It's one of the Fate of Phyllis videos about how Smurf was banned across the world by the Watchtower because some mother saw the Smurf moving and it must have been demonic. They love, <laughs> they love conspiracies. So, so, so can you see how the humor, humor and ownership of our past actually is quite useful. I love like Qawwali music, which is Islamic Sufi music. But I mean like Qawwali is a long tradition of being quite contentious within the Islamic background. So all these kind of things come together to make it very clear to us as well, because often we feel kind of cut. Like we, especially if you're from, let's say if you're from Pakistan and you come to the UK, you might not want to hear anything Islamic, right? And then you see ex-Muslims who are from the West and they're kind of having fun on Kufrmas, yeah, you know, or something like that. And you want to join in and then suddenly it helps you deal with your trauma. So it's a very interesting mechanism and I want someone study psychology to study it because it's so interesting how it helps people deal with trauma uh, but it also means for the outside world they don't see coconuts or if they do do that we just shout at them call them racist but they, you know uh, they, they, they don't see that as much so yeah okay thank you I know I've kind of taken your time so thank you very much